Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. All right, friends, before we get started, I want to shout out a very special Etsy store, Meraki Made Products. This is a store put together by a friend of mine, local to Minnesota. Um, He makes some cool gaming supplies. One of them is a measuring snake. The measuring snake uses magnetic one-inch increments that you can snap together, plus an end piece that is for specific models. So, for example, you can use a 32 millimeter end cap Um, Plus the base of the model equals two inches and then you can measure front to back. It's just like a magnetic bendy ruler and it's super cool and I highly recommend checking it out. There will be a link in the show notes. Additionally, we are going to do a raffle drawing where one lucky winner will win a measuring snake. If you would like to be entered in the drawing, comment in the discord combat snake. The winner will be determined by the end of the week. In this week's episode, we've got Gabe from Montreal. He talks about community building as well as playing Necrons, starting all the way back in the 2018 version of Kill Team, playing the Compendium version when Kill Team 2021 came out, and now Hyrotech Circle through all of the waves. Here's the conversation. How does one struggle through the pain and suffering of playing Necrons at the New York Open 2 and failing, I don't know, half your reanimation rolls? It's, uh, it's just how it goes. Like, it, that is literally how I roll. Yeah. I, because... I, the highlight of our interaction at the second New York Open was me walking by. You're like, I failed two of these reanimation rolls. And I was like, don't worry, on turn four, you surely couldn't miss three of your reanimation rolls. And then I walked by and I think you missed two or three of them. <laughs> like yep. The game was over. Yep. That's, uh, it's definitely improved, right? Now that uh, we did get the boost. So I've, since it came out, and I've, I think I failed twice, which is better than every time. This is, this is like twice at, during the course of a game, not at the end of the game, by the time when you would have expected that everybody had a chance to res at least once. Well, it's, it's also I've improved and had to res less, right? Because um, one of the things that has that I didn't realize about myself is that I learned mostly by playing games. Like I, I will read like, you know, articles on Gloomhammer about stuff, but I don't actually watch, you know, all these, um, these reports and things and, and, and look at the strategy. It's like, I am, I start by being bad and then I go to tournaments because that's where you play a lot. And then that's why I learn from people who know what they're doing. And then I just apply that. And then it, so I always come in with kind of um, like a disadvantage because I'm going to learn during the games, but then it, you know, it happens. And, and, and so um, with Necrons, the biggest advantage to compensate for my just terrible dice rolling is that I can pick weapons where I throw five dice, right? So I'm only failing two out of five instead of two out of four. Because that that will inevitably happen. It just it just does. So I have to play the game, compensating the fact that I can't depend on rolling good dice, right? So so I started playing objective team, right? Not kill team, because in the end it doesn't matter. Like if I know I've done this, like I've literally killed the entire opposing team with Necrons and just lost the game, because yeah. I mean with yeah, only. You know, with only as many APL as they have, if you're not playing the objectives, I mean, they are very killy. You can absolutely kill an opposing team, but oh, yeah. because you've got the low movement and it costs CP to get the movement a little bit higher, if you're not actually playing the objectives, you can lose track of a game very quickly and you just blow up your opponent and then you hit to turn three and you're like, well, I have two primary VP and it's definitely too late for me to catch up. Exactly. Because you can't, you can't make up for a deficit on turn four with a five with a six zero, because you can only score oh, no. four points a turn. 
So exactly. like you have to very you, you very much throughout a course of kill team. This is kind of like a generic thing that happens across all the teams. Is you do need to keep in mind how much you can actually rubber rubber band a delta in between turns two and three. Because yes. you can make if you can keep it relatively even on the first two turns, you can make it up on turns three and four. But you can't really make it up just on turn four. Exactly, there's no way. Even I mean, there's it. It doesn't matter how well it's going if if you're already down by five points and just, just lost the game. So that's the thing. It's it's keeping that in mind. And and for me, it's always additional layer of like, am I actually gonna roll the dice when you like on a two out? Am I gonna get it? Maybe. Yeah, and there's a 50% like, chance I won't. And there's like not that many tools within Hyrotech Circle that's like super duper reliable. Um, you've got that like immortal dude that hits on twos in shooting and melee. Um, but like even your even your leader like doesn't even have like super reliable hits. So I think they are like especially a team that wants to play points team, and they've got like great tools for scoring points. You've got multiple operatives that can fly. You've got super conceal. You can come back to life. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. Um, but I yeah. I like what you said about just like learning from from playing games, just like getting a bunch of reps. Um, I feel like I am definitely the same way. Um, and and also it's it's more likely to lead to like a creative outlook. Um, have you have you like come across any like particular insights or like plays or combos or anything that that you came across that was like something that you didn't read on the internet that is like something that you are especially excited about a niche well, tactic as it were <laughs> so the the most interesting tactic that i can possibly do with necrons is to explain that necrons can alpha strike because that completely disrupts the deployment for the other team I mean, like you know and then i take out the rulers like i can do this on the first turn so be careful. And then like they start messing because they're like, oh my God. So it's head yeah. games. I the intimidation I ruler. <laughs> yes. I have used this tactic many a time as a Pathfinder player. Famously at the World Championships. <laughs> my first opponent. Or I think my the first French opponent I played, I think we spent an hour in setup because he was asking me, How far can your grenadier move? And I was like, Well, if I move three inches on my recon sweep and three inches on a recon dash and I pop Montca and the ruler is now, you know, 21 inches and then I throw the grenade another six inches. Well, at that point, we're basically, you know, the the ruler is now the entire board. I'm just like, yeah. I can, this is this is where we can go handle yeah. it. And uh, yeah, so, so... You know, Necrons, because you have a crazy alpha strike, very similar to the Pathfinder one. You do something similar. And it is good. And it's not even re mean because you're really trying to give your opponent maximal information. But it's also as they set up for things, you get to you get to like poke holes in what they're doing because it messes up their plan. Exactly. And that's really the strength of the Alpha Street, because even though they will deploy in a way where it, it minimizes the impact, then I just go for points. Right. Because then they've they haven't placed optimally so i was like okay you know what <laughs> you've done that so i'll just do this yeah and just them not placing optimally is like the another version of an alpha strike yeah it's and it's it's part of the toolbox right because you and especially again for for my dice rolls like i i have to take all the tools that do not depend on just good luck because it's not it's i it just doesn't work so it's it's that's really fun and um and the problem eventually is that people take too long. <laughs> so they start like, oh, like, you know, the intent is for these guys not to be too together. So deployment does take a while. And then I've, I've, one of my um, favorite things to do here uh, with my player base here is just to have learning games where it's like, okay, we're going to talk through the entire process. Like the questions you should be asking during deployment, like, can you, you have AP, can you have blast, you have this, you have that, can you have you know conceal, can you charge from conceal? So when I explain this, I'm like, yeah, okay, I can alpha strike. So you know what? Just offer up a lamb. If you can, put this one guy and I'll kill him, maybe. Not with my dice rolls, but then you're not sacrificing the entire game just because I may, might do something, right? And the odds of me doing it are just terrible. Like I've I have blasted into a group of four dudes and like injured 
one guy and then the rest just walked on the skate. So, you know, it's 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 definitely more for me a psychological tool than, than an actual thing I could get away with. So as far as actually playing higher tech circle, you know, obviously the big question amongst all the players is which which cryptic are you playing? Because you know, we've had Ted on here from Minnesota. He plays Psychomancer. Having played Psychomancer once, I do think that there is something there. You do need to like drastically change how you approach the boards and what you're focusing on for them for that to work. But it sounds like if you're threatening the Alpha Strike, you're a Chronomancer stand. For um, for open, yes, because you and especially if you deploy, you know, vertical and you need the extra movement. And it's just faking, even if it's just a fake out. Yeah. It, and then and then he's going up, he is offering himself up. So they need to be able to withstand the like inevitable barrage that comes. And then I've done a good job with, you know, with the um, with the involves and the fuel more pains. So that is definitely a big thing. But but Psychomancer is just is just cool. Like it for especially into the dark, it's it's fun playing him. So it really depends if I am going in to play a game because I want to win or just because I want to play the game. Um, so, and I am not super competitive either. So even if I'm at a tournament, I'm there more to learn to play the game better than I am to get like a golden ticket. So sometimes I'll just, it is, it's a terrible idea to change tactics in the middle of a tournament for things you've never tried before, but I've, I've done it and it's like, oh, you can do this, right? So, so the Psychomancer definitely has um, a, a different game plan. You can still Alpha Strike. It, it takes more prep, but like the AP2 Blast is like, you know, it, it just eats through hordes, basically. Uh, the, the injuring uh, anyone now with bonus, you know... Um, with a little the, stun the attached ABL. to it, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the Technomancer I've never used, like it's, I could try, but then that takes a whole other set of games to figure out what the hell to do with him. And resing is less of a problem now that it, it used to be for me. So, so yes, so definitely Chronomancer, um, to, to intimidate, uh, and then Psychomancer just cause he's, he's fun to run. Yeah, I mean, the Chronomancer allows you to have two separate Alpha Strike plays, whereas the Psychomancer really is a solo Alpha Strike by himself with his Blast 2 AP2, which is powerful, and his defensive bubble is quite good. But having to be within six inches of the people you're debuffing does mean that your Psychomancer can be kind of risky, or your Apprentice can be riskily placed, which can be kind of a, a downside of using the Psychomancer. But when you're using the Chronomancer, you know, you've got... A feel no pain on one of your dudes that's flying up the board. I think Shane from Command Point was talking about how the Despotech hitting on two, wound, saving on a saving on threes with a feel no pain can suddenly, with intractable march, just blitz up twelve inches, stab someone, and blow someone up. All while re-rolling the first one he hits on his hitting on twos train. So it Which gives you, you a whole to... extra line of attack on open. Remember to declare that you can do it. <laughs> Yes. And like, oh, you know what? I could have rerolled that one dice, but yeah, because I, I, I will fail the two ups. Yeah, I mean, but, I've, uh, I missed twice in one of my games, and then I had to reroll one of those dice, and that cost me a CP down the line that I wasn't able to do. I barely squeaked out that game against Phil Gores, but you know, knowing to remember think... to demand better of yourself is very important. <laughs> no, but that's actually a good point. It's it's one of the pressures I feel that if I'm committing to Chronometron Alpha Strike uh, with it, e either um, either model is like, it has to work, right? And then, so I know I'm going to be spending all my CP on this one attack because I am committing to it. It has to do something. So if I, because I, I was playing against um, uh, Nemesis Claw, right? And then I rolled, uh, I whiffed on three of my four attacks and then they just... What's the the just a scratch that they have, and it's like oh nothing, you know yes, they completely invalid. Second. Yes, so I mean it, it does happen where it's like well, if you're doing this, you have to do it well, and it doesn't always work. So I I, I tend to start my my second turning point with ACP, and then I just use it on the um what was it 
um, the one where you, you always have a, a cover save. And that's, the oh, rest of the game. that's actually one that I was actually wondering about what your ploy usage was, because I found that while playing Necrons, there's a little bit of pressure on your strat ploys because you have to spend the one at the beginning of the game for your death mark to forward yes. deploy, which is very yes. powerful and definitely worth doing. If you can get a line on a spot where it overlooks things properly, your opponent has to commit a resource into a vantageable spot, then your cryptic can tell the death mark to go blow someone up. Which is very powerful. But it does mean that you start the game down a CP, which means that on first turn, it can be a little hard to want to use Intractable March, or it can be a little bit hard to actually want to do one of these reroll abilities or a defensive ploy. So you're talking about undying androids on turn two, yes. which is while you're not standing in cover, you can retain a free cover save while getting shot. Compared to a lot of players, I think, who I've heard use generally stick to within six inches, you get a reroll while shooting. So kind of walk us through a little bit about why you're doing it in that direction. Um, well, there's there's two things here, because, again, um, a lot of the deployment part is head games. So if I am forcing my opponent to set up in concealed, that means he's not going to be shooting me at me much, which means I can use intractable march more and less with impunity on the first turn, because there should be safe um now for the second turn it really depends on how badly i want to commit to moving versus killing someone and uh the free reroll tends like in my experience just tends not to amount to much it's like I, i'm not gonna Kill an extra dude just because I can reroll the one dice if I'm failing half my rolls. Um, whereas just being not caring whether I'm in cover or not just allows a bit more flexibility um, in in my own planning. Like I I would rather my opponent react to what I'm doing than the other way. So I I don't want to like I've already spent enough brain power setting up the first turn that second turn. It's, you know, I'll just come in and go for what I want to do, and you have to do something about it, as opposed to me, you know, trying to kill you. Yeah, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Does that mean that you're playing a recon archetype, or are you playing security still? I'm playing recon, because despite the terrible, terrible um, mobility, it's still enough that i can decide what to do and then you know your your space cats they just fly over the place as long as you're within six to revive the one outlier you should be able to use them to compensate for everything else so it's usually like pick up item secure vantage that's that's my my playbook um i've i've started doing other things depending on on the map setup and the team but I find those to be the ones that are already drilled into my head that I know how to score them more or less despite whatever the other team is throwing at me. All right. In in uh, what is a schism in the higher tech circle player fan base right now between using recon or security. So I think it's good. I think it's good. Like if you have a game plan where you can score recon and you can play defensively on your half of the board, which you can kind of do on some maps. His vantage points are close enough, and if you can keep your bugs relatively safe, then maybe it's fine. As long as you're getting your opponent to open up to react to your recon plays. That's the thing. Like It, it has to come with a certain... You know, and it's the thing. Like I kind of like to talk out loud about what I'm doing because it's it's kind of like gaming my opponent to like, being afraid of what I could do rather than reacting to necessarily what I'm actually doing. Right. So I do, <laughs> it makes me a bit talky sometimes during, during matches and makes me take longer. But if, I find that if I don't do this, it definitely limits my ability to just, you know, I have to compensate the role somehow. Right. So it's, it's really a lot, a lot about the, the meta during the game that that i use to influence the outcomes which is why i don't you know win terms 
It's it's I mean, you know, at the New York Open, you're purely kept down by terrible reanimation rolls. This time, this year, you're going to you're going to be up you're going to be up there with your two up res rolls, right? Well, we'll see cuz I I honestly really want to try the narrative game. Like it looks so much fun that um and I I already went to our tournaments here. Like we only have two opportunities for a golden ticket in in Eastern Canada so far. Um I did place third and one uh and then the other one i like i was like you know what let's just have fun so i'm and i would like to also learn how to run uh, a narrative game so i'm like well the best place to learn is just playing one right yeah i mean you know you brought montreal you're one of the tos in the montreal region or you're at least helping out the tos you want to tell us a little bit about your scene and what you've been working up on the east coast of canada so um montreal has it's it's very particular so let's start like i got into kill team back in 2018 because i finally found the opportunity to get into warhammer that didn't seem so uh intimidating like i i had you know like a friend of mine in uh university like years ago way too long ago um her her dad used to build minis and then she learned to do that and then she would buy warhammer sets build them paint them and sell them on ebay and she had all the the books so i, I would read the book and I'm like wow this looks really fun right so i went to uh our local um warhammer store and you know it's all the models and everything and like ah you know that looks cool but i don't i'm not an artist like i can't paint and you need it so many things and commit so much money and time and dedication that it was like, ah, oh, you know, no, not for me, despite it, them looking so cool. So 2018 rolls out and I'm like, oh, wow, they just announced like this, this miniature version of Warhammer. I'm like, wow, that looks so cool. Look at those models and like the terrain, you get everything in a single box. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. But then like, oh, do I really want to do this? And then like, oh, I missed my window. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I got to get in somehow. And then I bought the companion, the original companion book. And it's like, oh, look at these space skeletons. They look so cool, right? <laughs> so I started hunting down. I'm like, oh, maybe they sell them like on Facebook or something. Oh, and cool. like, Background oh, models. Yeah, or like anything, honestly, at that point. It's like, I just want the models. And um, so I got I went to what is now my local store because I set that up as a, a, a buying point for this guy who was selling like 10 mortals for like 20 bucks. I don't know. It's Canadian, right? It was cheap. So I was like, OK, cool. You know what? I'll just buy them. And to this day, I still use those models and they still have the white primer. I don't know what the hell you put on it. Like I've I've washed them. Quite a few times, I like kit bashing, so I, I do use uh, super glue and, and not plastic cement. So I have disassembled them more than once, and they're like they're still white from the original primer. But I mean, aerosol primer does stick pretty well, just because it sol- it, there's like a solvent attached to yeah, spray primer. Not the one I use though. It's just that white primer. Is just, it might just be an old one that has uh, like, yeah, really, really yeah. hardcore solvent. So so uh, I started talking to more people who went to the store because they had like a play area and and a few people were interested this is all for kill team 18 still 18 yeah so Mm -hmm. we started playing and then it's like it was fun in the sense like i could play like i had all the stuff i needed but it was so much freaking rolling a single dice right and then nothing would happen for like the entire game so that kind of it, it turned you off. Kind of killed me. Yeah, yeah. The, the fun was like uh, nothing. Through, it was not. I like the rules. I like the fact like you could just build whatever crazy team you wanted to. But I couldn't find any players. Like people tried it, they were like, "Oh, it's fun," but then they went back to their full forty k armies, right? And and that was kind of it. So uh, I got into other games. That's when I got like into. I tried uh, Infinity, uh, Frostgrave. Um, like these other random Kickstarter skirmish games. Like skirmish you were basically, you wanted to play skirmish level, but I think this is actually a common thing in a lot of communities, and we've heard this elsewhere. Is that 40k players generally don't go down to kill team? Kill team yeah. is appealing to a different 
base of players yeah. for any so for any tos who are like trying to figure out where to get new kill team players generally not... you're looking for like skirmish games so people that want to get into warhammer like the warhammer universe but they don't want all the stuff that's kind of the player base and 40k players dip their toe in but a lot of the ones that i've talked to they're like but i want to play with my tanks i'm like that's fair no and it's it's a completely valid um reason because you're you're putting so much effort into having this like beautifully painted army that why the hell won't you use it right i mm-hmm. got into uh i wanted to do the same thing i wanted to have the same experience 40k was just too much so i dipped into horse heresy instead like i started reading the books during the pandemic and then like i finished them i got to the point where i caught up when they were doing the the C, uh, siege of terra series like the final three books so those i actually read like physically but um it was like i yeah tanks tanks miniature tanks so yeah you want your tanks right and and i can like maybe now that i've almost painted up my guys i could maybe put a tank as uh terrain but that's that's pretty much as far as you can get in uh, kill team but it definitely speaks to a different audience so by the time uh kill team 21 came out I'm like, okay, let's like this. This has to be better, right? They they changed the entire um, the mechanics to be suited to fast pace, right? It wasn't miniature 40k. It was like it's its own game, and it makes a lot it's more XCOM. sense. It's yeah. XCOM. Everyone gets two actions. Everyone gets to shoot, and then Space Marines get to break the rules. I mean, I think exactly the dice rolling is much better because I have heard this complaint about the old kill team. You roll a lot of dice and nothing happens, and because it's a competitive game, if nothing is happening, it really is like, oh, I missed an injury roll. Game kind of collapsed from there. Yeah. Versus, you know, I something mean, like Kill Team Twenty Twenty One, where you always get to feel like you're doing something. Well, almost always. Sorry. Maybe not when you're trying to res and can't, but. Um, the yeah i mean i still have like this these really cool stories you can't really jump that much from the new kill team the old one i remember i was playing gray knights versus um orcs and this one grot fell from like two stories high onto my gray knight and killed it this is awesome so so kill team 2018 not a lot of people played too many of the dice rolls just did nothing which is a complaint that i heard locally when i was still living in california so i do empathize with that what about Kill Team 2021? You know, we got the new box set. We've got Commandos. We got the Veteran Guardsman. That's why I got it in Kill Team 2021, because I always wanted Vet Guard when I was a kid. So how did your local community take to it? Well, I mean, I just transplanted my Necrons and started just asking people to play with me. And the taste of Kill Team 18 was still sour in everyone's mouth and it was like during covid so it was not a great response so i did get a few matches out of pity i'd say more than anything else um meaning that by the time my friend devin came around i you know i'd played maybe like i don't know four or five games tops and then we started playing he brought in his I think it started with Pathfinder. So we've been using the same teams for like a while now. Yeah, and I pin on the Pathfinder thing because I think Pathfinders <laughs> versus Necrons is a pretty interesting topic. And I'm yeah. sure some listeners have been kind of curious how that matchup goes. It 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 can swing. It can swing. It, de- it really depends on how much I'm trying to focus down on just you know it being a grudge match rather yeah. than trying to win the game. But um Devin. Yeah, no, he, he, yeah, of course. Like it, it, and like I said, we were at uh, the uh, Trois Rivières uh, Kill Team tournament here, which is one of two golden ticket events around Montreal. This one is like an hour east, and then there's one in Ottawa, which is an hour or two hours uh, west, which is like our only options right now. So it did devolve into a grudge match. That was the last, we, we came in, uh, we were top two for the last uh, round. And it, we went at it so hard that neither of us ended up first. So, you know, great. But uh, the first the top player did, um, he couldn't, he knew he wouldn't be able to make it to Atlanta. So Devin got the ticket. So he's uh, part of Team Canada, who will be joining, hopefully, you guys um, for oh, the, nice. yeah, the match in, in November, the matches in November. But um, basically, the scene here never really took off in okay and this is where 
in the initial days of Kill Team 2021, it was slow going. Not only that, but and and this is where I'm going to be a bit more going into death about what, for me, what building a community has been about, right? So Montreal is in Quebec, in Canada. So we are, you know, by default, uh, bilingual, right? Most people either favor French or English. I live in the West, which means that I live in the Anglophone region. Um, but the biggest stores are in the East, in the Francophone region. So we automatically have that divide, which is a psychological thing. Um, but it definitely influences how you respond to, you know, calls to actions like, do you want to play Kill Team? Or, est-ce que quelqu'un veut une partie? So it's a very different way of seeing things. Um, so you do have, uh, we do have a Kill Team Montreal page. And it's like so barren, man. Like the, the poor guy who was running it, um, just he, I think he tried and tried and no one was really responded. So he's like, does anyone want to be like the freaking men? I'm like, sure, why not? Right. And I post and then some people respond sometimes. And then I, I'm like, okay, you know what? Stop posting just in English, start posting in French. I'm like, okay, so. It's like you get different responses depending on, and like, so, okay, you know what? Just post in both languages, French first, and that's just nicer. Um, so my local community is Anglophone. So all the players or the majority of players that go to my store, which is Ted's Hobby Shop in Point Claire, which is just the best, um, they are mostly Anglophones. They, they're definitely Francophones, but a lot of them just switch to English just because it's, you know, the easier. game is written in English. I think at this no, no, point we've seen not even the game because we do have all the manuals in French. I'm just talking no, about like I'm, I'm just saying that like for rules writing, we've seen enough rules inaccuracy when things are translated into other languages that I oh, think yeah. a lot of the no. other countries default to the English rule book first because that's the the correct and one. So. The correct and it's still like so poorly written. Like oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's like you know we were lucky that UGW's main language is english right because otherwise it'd just be yeah. but anyway i digress so the 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 community here my community is mostly anglophone and it's mostly made of 40k players and like we we were talking like 40k players will rarely downgrade to kill team mm-hmm. so it's more about looking for other people so i did start going out to other stores um montreal is an island above montreal there's the island of laval so you cross the bridge and there's two really nice stores there. There's Bede Cosmos and there's Toujours Jeu, or Always Game. And they tried doing things by, so like setting up Kill Team Nights. And I did go, but, and they, like the, the Bede Cosmos, like they build really nice tables. Like they're, they're standing height with, you know, borders so you can't, you know, throw your dice on the floor. But no one came. It was, it was just like, oh yeah, you know, this, this one guy who had played Vetgard once and like, okay, mm-hmm. so I went back again. It's, it's a bit further for me to go to. So it's like, well, if I'm going extra distance, spending extra time for less, I'm like, well, I'll just go back to what I was doing. Right. Um, and there's another store way in the East, which is Francophone, which is awesome. Just Labis, where all the bigger 40 K tournaments are held here. And it was the same story. Like they, they do hold some like they promote kill team, but you go and it's like maybe one or two other people. Um, then there's like the Warhammer store, right? It's smack downtown, but it's tiny. Um, you're lucky if you're, you know, like not touching butts with other people while you're playing there. And I have attended a couple of tournaments there, uh, store organized by, and <laughs> I mean, they're great guys, but they were like using, they were, it was kind of a mess. Like we even had to provide, our own um, into the dark terrain at one point because they just didn't have it. So, so how have you were... adapted to the, you know, the myriad of situations? Because you're, at this point, it sounds like you are one of the Montreal community heads, right? <laughs> I mean, by default, right? Not really because I was looking for it. But there was a demand. Like when we went to the, the GW store, there were people who drove all the way from Quebec City, which is like two hours out. I'm like, that's crazy. Like, why are you coming all the way here? Is it just because there's no, like, official events? Maybe if we try to do something and made it more inclusive, it would work. The problem I had for a long time was that there's no central place to do it. 
right? Because like my store was in the West, you need a car to get there. There's no public, but it's hard to get there by public transport. Um, there's a store all the way in the East, same story. So um, last year, these two guys showed up at our store um, and they were great. They were just getting started. They were doing tours of all the stores in the area looking for games. Right. And no one, the same problem. Like, no, it didn't take anywhere. Like, people were playing 40K and that was it. So they came around, like, yeah, yeah, just join us. Like, and, and I was so happy. Like, I'm always happy to introduce players to the game and just make them better players because it helps them if they want to, you know, go competitive. And it helps me because then I have good opponents. So uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we, we, we play downtown this other sort called uh, Card Brawlers. And I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. You know what? I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give it a try someday. And I went, and it was like, oh my god, this is what I've been looking for. Like, it's it's a central store next to the metro, next to the subway, and this really means that it's the best of both worlds because we we hold something on a weekend. There's parking spots on the street, and if not, well, there's the metro, which is like you know, it's right next to it. So um, they had they had been trying to start a scene too they have a 40k scene going kill team's like uh it's 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 always going to be difficult for us because it's always a minority game and it's easy for something someone to to say oh i like these minis why don't i just upgrade to a big army in 40k right you lose a player yeah. um and that's it like we we talked to the the owner uh david and he was like yeah you know what just tell me what you need so that's that's how it got really I would never have really considered doing this seriously un, until I had a place to a do it base. where yes and it's a home base where even for me like if I want to go on a you know Thursday night it takes me an hour to get there because of traffic which is terrible it, get, it takes me like 10 minutes to get to my store in the other direction so it's it's really because I, I like I want this so bad that I'm I'm willing to you know to do it and and there's there's enough people here who are looking for for a community that it's you know it's more a matter of dedicating time time more than anything else and being consistent right because i've seen stores say yeah, yeah kill team day and then like no one shows up i'm like okay that's fine like that's it um and it's not about you know us versus them it's like it's really it's like it's a one montreal community so I don't care if you speak English or French or whatever, like I will play the game with you because that's what's fun. And that's the thing, like for me, the entire point of this game, more than strategy, more than like winning, it's like, am I having a good time? Despite my awful, awful dice rolls, like, am I enjoying the time I'm spending here? And it's like, yes, because I'm looking at these minis, I'm reading like the GW preview articles, I'm buying them, I'm building them, I'm painting them, and play. it's like, Compared to board games, I love board games. You can see them in the background here. Um, it's like, okay, yeah, one board game will come out maybe once every six months, right? And that's and that's how they rotate. If you have a, even if you have like a regular group, but with uh, especially with Kill Team, it's like the or just miniatures in general. You spend so much time and love, you know, with them that it's it pays off. I, I feel a lot. So why not try and give this back, right? Why not try and build a community that um, is based on like the enjoyment of the game more than anything else? And if you can throw in like a competitive event for people who like that, because like people like you, you know, you just, there's something, there's a flip there that you can't unswitch. And if you're gonna play, you want to win, because because you know that's the point of the game. It's like okay, we can do that too. And 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 we do have people on our team so one of the things i love about uh looking at like scrolling through the the bcp and the utc events is just team names like some some are, are clever right some i just laugh at um i i joined i recently joined the kill team um mexico page just because i met these uh mexican guys at the store way out in the east i'm like yeah join join the montreal kill team page because we have a page on facebook just to see if there's stuff going on. And then I never heard from them. So, you know, hopefully they're still out there playing Kill Team. But um, 
Like, yeah, they, they probably play this uh, in Mexico. I've never seen anyone play this in, in El Salvador. And it's, it's a whole other thing. Like, it's, it's a cultural-based uh, perception that board games are low class. And Latin culture is very much based on appearance and presentation and social circles and cliques and what are you doing with your time kind of thing. And it's like a whole deal. So I'm like, okay, you know, I don't care. Like, let's see what they're doing in Mexico because it's the biggest community. I know there are games in Mexico. And um, so I, I got in and like they're, the main team there is, is uh, Chila Killers which is a pun on chilaquila, which is a Mexican breakfast dish. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. So um, our name is You'll Die. So the airport code for Montreal is Y-U-L, right? And then die. And when I thought of the logo, it's like the number one, because that's what I roll the most. So <laughs> it is it is literally, a it's a dice. And it's like the one is the, 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 the I from You'll Die. Right. And and we were thinking about the tournament. Well, what should we call this? And then Devin's like, yeah, you'll die trying because that's what we're, you know, that's, it's an attempt. And you got to one of the big things about getting better in any competitive game that players have to realize is not about the winning. It's about being able to take lessons away while you're losing, because, you know, I started playing competitively in Magic the Gathering, where when you lose in a draft, you have to be able to figure out why you lost and you have to be able to do it objectively outside of the result because there are many times in kill team when you're looking at a thing you're like well i just rolled a cp you know i just spent it so i could get a reroll so i could do some damage but if that one reroll was not going to actually get a kill there was no point in doing it i think an easy example of this was pre-buff star striders when you had the big laser beam if you only hit one die on your four attacks on fours, six, seven, AP two gun, there's almost no reason to CP reroll the first time because two dice is not going to kill a target unless you've got a crit. So you're really looking for three hits. If you're looking for three hits, you have to spend two CP, which means you're giving up <clears throat> lethal proximity, undaunted explorers or some other crazy thing. So it's very easy to justify like, oh, I spent a CP. I got an extra hit. Cool. That was damage. But that's not how you get better at games. And that's not how you objectively figure out what's going on. So being able to make it through re rolling in a bunch of ones and being like, well, it was fine that I rolled a bunch of ones here because it's not correct to reroll those ones. Sometimes you just have to take it on lumps and say next time four dice on threes, I'll roll better. And that's that's where that's what you have to work with the actual numbers not just like oh, yeah. i just felt like doing this and sometimes yeah. you have to really think about it. you're like i have a one in six chance but if i don't do this i will lose the game and then you need to do it yeah there's there's desperation and there's tactics right and uh and that's the thing like if, and knowing I've, when to switch gears is how players yes. get better yes exactly and that's what I've, I've learned most more than anything else is is to learn to not depend on the dice rolls like it's just it's just tactics pre-game during the game, is doing things where I'm forcing the opponent to react to me. And it's not my dice that matter, it's theirs. And then I don't have to spend those CP rerolls because I know I will if, if, I, if it's like I'm addicted to spending them on the first turn. That's, that's terrible. That's the worst thing. As, as a community person, you, know, you get to mix in the lesson of persistence and sticking out like oh i came to the you know the meeting at card brawlers there's one person this week i taught one person and then next week maybe there's no people and then the week after you have like three people you're like cool 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 this is fun but you one common thing amongst all of our to interviews that we've had on here not just you is persistence and finding a home base if you can find a home base and you can be persistent you will find a community because everybody people do want to play and go outside maybe not everybody but enough people where you should be able to get your little community of four to six players and maybe sometimes make some real, real friends along the way. Well, I mean, yeah, right. That's, that's the, I think the most enjoyable part of the game is meeting new people. And uh, so far my experience at basically every place I've been is like this specific community is, is really nice because, you know, you hear a lot of bad things about 40 K players, Warhammer players in general, they're very, you know, they're just jerks, right? But so far, everyone I've met has been great. And and I think that's one of the highlights of this game. And maybe it skews my perception because it's not necessarily the most fun game I've played. I think 
war cry for me is that it's just because you can do crazy things and it's they allow it um but it's just the sense of i am enjoying good time with this person who is also having good time and that's 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 it right so more than anything else that's that's what i look for and i want to provide that for people i interact with so yeah it takes exactly you're saying it takes dedication it takes um commitment you have to you have to do it someone has to do it <laughs> and if someone no one else is doing do it, it. yeah yes. no one else is doing it well you know what so do it yourself. sometimes you just got to do it yourself yeah but yeah. you know you and Devin have been doing it yourselves for it sounds like since the beginning of this kill team edition now he's going to the world championships but you've we're talking about the grudge match between pathfinders and higher tech circle I've heard that Pathfinders generally have the edge in higher tech circle matchup. I think conceptually, I kind of agree. What has your experience been like? And what do you think? What do you think about the uh, general meta consensus? Well, the, the, you know, from again, like my um, awareness of the meta is limited. So um, I do understand that Pathfinders should have an easier time because of just the way they're set up and the way they're meant to be played. And once we learned how to play them properly, it was a vastly different game because when we started, it was, it was terrible. Um, but for our grudge match, I don't keep track. He does, <laughs> apparently, because he was so happy to beat the crap out of me at the tournament. He's like, yes, finally, into the dark. I, you know. Um, so yeah, I guess I, it, I think it has more to do with the fact that I play a certain way rather than the team I am playing because we switched back to blooded. We were running a narrative campaign with blooded for a while against his pathfinders. And he was just like, you know, I was just puffs of smoky blood for most of the time. Cause I was being way too aggressive. Um, and then when I got back to it, applying everything I'd learned with heretic, it was such a different game. So for me, I'm never going to reach like apex, you know, first, you know, top three, top 10 at a tournament. But I find that I'm better as a gatekeeper to, for other people who want to understand, you know, leveling up from casual to competitive game. So, because the, it's the tactics, it's like the mindset I have during the game that changes. It's, it's not so much about heretic versus Tau. Although, yes, I make it hard for him and I enjoy doing it. It's more about like, you know, what can, what tools do I have and what can I do against my opponent? It's my last game at, at the, the Three Rivers or Trois Rivières uh, tournament was against Mandrakes. No, no, sorry. This was at CTC in Ottawa. Okay. Um, and you were against Mandrakes. You were able to, I was against, you, did you take the win? So, no, uh, I did not. But uh, it was against Alex, who I met at NYO actually last year. And he's a great guy. He's, he's in Toronto. And he will also be going to um, to Atlanta, so you'll be seeing more of him. And uh, he's part of Maple Leaf Wargaming. So the thing is, it took so long to set up, and for me to ask so many freaking questions about what the hell was going on, that the first turn just took you know it took way more than it should have. And then second turn, I understood what the hell was going on, and I started killing him, <laughs> which is fun, but we never got to turning point four mm. and you know, some of my VPs, I could only score them. Then my, my secondaries, my, um, um, Spend uh, all tech the time killing the mandrakes because they only have eight wounds at the end of the day. Exactly. So but, it, was but really... it does take time. It does take a couple of turns. You do got to blow them up. I was actually thinking after my first game against mandrakes that maybe you take the Teslas just so that you have the extra dice since they have the in oh, no, anyway. No. no, no, no. You don't understand. I always take the Teslas because one more die just means that it's one more chance to not roll a one. And that's really, that's why I like the, the Necrons is like, I can, I can choose to do either one. And generally Teslas, I default to because it's just more dice and that's it. It's just weight for me specifically. And that's helped a lot, but, um, yeah, so Mandrix were were a very interesting matchup, and and this is this is it. This is how I learned during games. It's like it takes me a while to figure them out. I played so many Phobos at NYO 
last year that by the time last match came, I was like, okay, just do this, right? And it was it, it became e- easier every time. And I think I t- out of the three or four games I had, I, I lost one maybe because, you know, you figure them out. And that's the thing. It's like, again, there's n- not a specific team tra- strategy that I'm using. It's just like, what are your tools? What are mine? And what can I do against them? And it's kind of on the fly, which makes me a good teacher in person, but makes me really bad at trying to explain it as a generalized strategy. Like I can't make a guide for Necrons aside from like the basic tools you have, but, but replying them, like I need to be playing against you and show you this is what I can do. And this is what you can do in response. All right. All right. You've got a couple tournaments coming up still in Montreal. I think you said you've got the July 13th tournament. Is that yes. right? You so talk we're to our listeners, you know, I know we do have a couple Canadian listeners since we've had a handful of Canadian folks on here. So tell us a little bit about the tournament. Maybe we can get the Toronto people to make the schlep out. Well, the tournament is uh, we're keeping it small. So we're we're doing the you'll die trying RTT at Card Brawlers on July 13th. It's uh, three games. It's open and ITD. And uh, we're going to aim for learning how to run a tournament before we, well, how to walk a tournament before we run. So it's really a test drive. And we're doing one in July, and then we're doing a second one at Ted's Hobby Shop, either August or September, to test out whether there is a difference between holding something downtown versus, you know, somewhere closer to where you need a car. And it's really more testing. Next year, the idea is if we can run this properly and everything, then we're going to hold a full GT with a golden ticket. But we need to make sure we can actually do it, right? Because the first time we're, we're, we're doing uh, any sort of event. And while Card Brawlers does host multiple events, mostly for card games, obviously. Uh, they're, they're definitely helping out with, with a lot, with the, um, some of the terrain, um, their experience and everything. But the point is that this is meant to unify people here, right? So anyone who wants to try it out, it's a beginner-friendly tournament. We're even uh, encouraging people to just come with their, whatever minis they have. We're not counting the 2VP for fully painted. We just want people to experience what it is to play kill team competitively if you like it fantastic if you don't well we want to set up something regular where you can just come play games have fun right that's really the point for me is just getting having a place and time for people to come and enjoy the game yeah that makes sense i think i also do a similar thing i've got no no painting requirement at our local tournaments, only for the big stuff, just because I would rather people come out and play. Because Kill Team's a fun game, and the community's been really nice. I mean, I know that Jason's had similar experiences in his area. Yeah, I mean, just... It is a great community, and it seems like people that have ported over from other games have talked about how, like, the Kill Team players tend to be super fun and super chill and easy to get along with. And I've heard other people, like, tell the same stories. Um, I was just chatting with one of my friends that moved to Florida, and uh, he was pretty much saying, like, that was the same reaction that, like, people playing in his scene were saying, too. So it seems like it's pretty universal. Yeah, I, and that's that's part of the... What makes it so enjoyable? It's not just the game itself. It's it's really the the community like I, that. The people I play with, they're great. And what I want to build is something for everyone. So I, and it's, you know, as long as we can keep that spirit open, and that's why I don't like. I think I have the right temperament to build a community base because I'm not trying to freaking just yeah, you know, hit you a square in the forehead. It's like I'm I'm trying for you to become a better player. Like that's what I want for people here. So then. When we face off against you guys, that's when, you know, claws come out. <laughs> this is uh, at the World Championships. We're going to have a Canadian-U.S. rivalry. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Because we have we do have at least three players going. No, or four. Mm-hmm. Not sure how many. Wait. 
There's one there. So there should be maybe four players. Yeah, going I think this year, if uh, local my, one of my local players, True, doesn't fly up to go steal a <laughs> Canadian ticket, I think yeah. he doesn't have oh, at, that, least, you know, at that, least four. That traumatized us. Like it's <laughs> he he has he has a rep here, right? So yeah. he he local, wasn't around. Local New York man flies to Canada, steals a ticket, <laughs> and goes to the World Championships. Yep. All Canadians feel this this mental anguish and warp. Oh yeah, it was uh, it was a blow to our pride. So we're we're making sure that you know we have. I mean, this year you just gotta have, send someone to take the New York Open crown, and that way True will really know what he started. Yeah, I mean that's the point, right? We're we're going. We're definitely going to be there. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, I this year's New yeah. York Open, October twenty six, twenty seven. We have the dates up, but not the tickets. So for anyone who's listening who doesn't know the dates, that's uh that's when it's happening. And actually, later this summer for ACO since or or Goonhammer since we're here, and I'm talking about like other tournament dates outside of this July 13th one that Gabe is running. We will also have the Goonhammer Open on July 6th, 7th, the basically July 4th weekend in Baltimore. We will have a $300 first place prize. So yeah, and a golden ticket. So anyone who's interested, you know, maybe some Canadians come down and scoop a ticket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not like you guys have Independence Day on July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. No, but it's it's definitely something that's tempting. It's just like the U.S. is it's so big. Like, it's just going to one event or another. Like, you have to kind of pick your battles, right? And yeah, and yeah. I have the good fortune of having family I can stay at in New York. So it's really easy. It's just one more trip for me. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not cheap going to New York. It's not the easiest, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I know you guys are running a uh, Goonhammer Open in Canada too, right? But it's all the other way. Oh, it might be. West. There's I, there's probably Goonhammer's got its uh its reach everywhere this year. We have a UK Goonhammer Open. We have the Baltimore one, and then we have I guess there's one on the West Coast. I actually haven't been keeping track of all the stuff that's happening internally since I've got the stuff locally that I have to manage. Yeah. No, I have been paying attention to what is being run in Canada, and that's there's only three golden ticket events that I know of so far. There's two on East Coast, and there's one West Coast, and yeah, hopefully Canadian there'll be one the, more. Canadian players on the resurgence, you know, after the LVO performance of Vivek, I'm sure that yeah. all the Canadians are like, oh, we can do it. We just gotta get there. That's right. All right. You any other, you know, local heroes you want to shout out? I know Devin's gotten quite a few shout outs at this point, but any other local players in the Montreal scene that have done big work or helped you paint terrain or just come out consistently? Well, uh, shout out to Nick and Joff. They've uh, they've been great. They've they've joined our team and have put in the work like it's it's funny because uh, like I, I it's, it's we're doing this for fun, but they, they they're actually willing to learn and and nick has placed at the events so he's he's really good um we had the training game with joff so he should be ready for next time but uh no otherwise like that's the point it's like i want our our little community to to grow and for us to just you know next time next year maybe you know and at nyl you have a full delegation of us to deal with all righty, Gabe. Well, you know, if uh, hopefully Montreal players, if you're here or Toronto players, I know that, you know, Jess Poon and and George out there, maybe you got maybe they can show up to the July 13th tournament just to just to mess around and show what some of the most competitive players in Canada could do. Uh, thanks for coming on, Gabe. It was a uh, it's fun talking about higher tech circle and building up your local community because I feel like that hard work, determination and finding a home base definitely are things that a lot of players might not realize they can do locally because, you know, you're playing at a card shop, which might not be the first choice for a lot of players. But anything can work as long as you can find consistent space and you can be there and players can get there. Yeah, well, thanks. for It's it's been a joy to be here. Um, you guys are great. Um and uh yeah i mean like if anyone takes anything from this is that you just need time more than anything else right it's like it, it's probably not going to work the first time or the second but if you keep at it you will hopefully find people that share the same passions as you do and then you just do it i just wanted to give a patreon shout out to our most recent three subscribers 
And thank you guys for subscribing to the Patreon. Two of you may have won a little thing from Dakota of Luster's Workshop for our All Valley Team Tournament shout out. But Jeff A or Jeff, Shane, and Robot, thanks for joining the Discord or the Patreon. Welcome to the inner circle. Get out there and build your scenes. Or go outside and play some games. You know, sometimes those two end up mixing together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks for coming on, and thank you listeners for listening until the end. We'll see you next week.